Hello everyone, Peter Newman from Ari and Weed Smart with you. How are you going? Good to have you all on for this morning's or this afternoon's, I should say, Weed Smart webinar, joined by Ben White. How are you, Ben? I'm well, thanks, Pete. Ben is obviously with Condinan Group, and uh, you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, automated weed control uh, this morning. Before oh, this afternoon, I've done it again. Uh, before we get to that, I will just do the standard couple of bits of uh, housekeeping. Um, and just to let you know that Weed Smart is this industry funded initiative and on, the, on your screen there is all of our supporters. We're really grateful for the support. So everybody above the line gives financial support and uh, everyone below the line gives in kind support. Our latest new members on there, Primary Sales joining us um, with some financial support. Great to have them on board. And I think uh, University of Sydney, and I think it might be Charles Sturt University, hopefully I've got that right, are also new in-kind supporters. Um, so yeah, Weed Smart aims to, we pull the funds and the support from all of those people and deliver that consistent message around Australia about managing herbicide resistant weeds largely uh, with that single industry voice. Just uh, a little bit more promoting Weed Smart. We've got Weed Smart Week coming up. We've got two of them actually, Weed Smart Weeks. So one in Emerald in Queensland between the 13th and 15th of August and one in Horsham, uh, Victoria between the 27th and 29th of August. They both pretty well run as a one day seminar with two days field trip and they'll be at the Horsham event. Really looking forward to it, should be pretty amazing. We've got some really good displays, really good speakers. They're very practical events these. They're not your technical updates, they're more practical updates. Lots of farmer and agronomist speakers and uh, lots of practical information about managing weeds. Just a little tiny bit more housekeeping. Um, we've, you might have this big box sitting uh, on your screen. If you want to get that out of the way, just click on that little arrow there. And these webinars run really well with lots of questions. That's what it's all about. So as we go, type your questions in. I will pause periodically and ask the question of Ben, have a bit of discussion and keep moving. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to, to Ben now. So Ben, this morning you'll be telling us a bit about uh, automation and weed control. I'll let you um, get over and start your presentation in a moment, but you've uh, had plenty of opportunities with your work with Condinan Group to, to see quite a few of these tools, I take it? Yeah, that's right, Peter. I suppose um, I'm, I've been fortunate in that I've been able to see both the automation side of things and, and also uh, have kept pretty keen interest on what's happening in weed control. And I guess it's, uh, it's about bringing those two technologies together is what we're really talking about today. So I've kind of split the presentation up uh, into those two components and I, and I guess um, yeah we can have a chat about how some of those might interact um, both the autonomy and, and also the weed control options and some that are obviously uh, more suited to a, an autonomous platform than having someone behind the wheel. Sounds good mate. Well I will get out of the way and let you uh, start up with your presentation and as I said I'll interject with uh, questions as we go. No worries at all. So yeah as I said we'll, we'll kick off and we'll break it into those uh, into those two sections and I suppose the first we'll work on is uh, just on the weed control options suited perhaps to aut uh, autonomy specifically. Um, obviously there's a, a lot of other options out there but given that's a topic for today uh, we'll focus uh, a little more closely on those. Uh, and the first uh, which I think is really exciting and, and people will have seen this around the place recently it's been gathering quite a bit of, uh, of press is the mechanical weed chipper. Um, operating speed around 10 k's per hour which uh, as, as a lot of these um, yeah, innovations and weed control methods uh, are probably a little bit slower than people would normally travel which makes them ideal uh, for autonomous operations. So uh, yeah, weed chipper goes along obviously using uh, uh, weed it, um, technology to detect the weeds and then a series of times uh, operated to mechanically chip out uh, the weeds as you go along. So. That one I think is uh, is pretty exciting and, and certainly lends itself to an autonomous platform, not necessarily on a large machine that we've seen there, and perhaps at a smaller scale. So uh, the next one I thought we'd talk about is Blue River, and this is one that uh, that's pretty interesting. And, and um, Blue River was acquired by John Deere last year, 
for around three hundred million dollars. It's a, a lot of money uh, by anyone's checkbook. Um, yeah, look, the, the Blue River, the River system is interesting and, and a little bit different in terms of selective spraying in that uh, it uses a series of, uh, of very uh, narrow bands of spray to, uh, to to take out weeds selectively. And I think um, uh, if we just click here, we can get a bit of video of it operating. This is uh, in, a, in a cotton uh, plant environment. Uh, you can see uh, those small jets, I think they're only about 25 mils wide, Taking out weeds uh, either side of the uh, of the cotton uh, in the row there, so um, that's some technology that I think probably um, now that it's in the hands of deer will probably take a little bit longer to get to market. They'll like to make sure that uh, all the T's are crossed and the I's dotted. So, uh, but that's definitely one to to look out for, and again, um, it lends itself to to potentially uh, autonomous operation. So then um, just um, between those two, um, it's quite a quite a difference, isn't there? I mean, the first one, the tine, the chipper is just green from brown, and it's a coarse sort of implement, isn't it? But if you just go back to that Blue River one, the thing I'm amazed with this one is it is green on green identification, but not only that, it really prints the herbicide on, doesn't it, around the um, the crop plants and prints it on the weeds rather than turning on a whole nozzle and spraying a patch. It really is very fine in, in how it can spray around a crop plant. Yeah, I think it's that level of precision that makes this quite unique, uh, Pete. And I think, uh, you know, as I said, you know, there, there are 25 mil bands of, of spray and you, and you might get a number of, of them on a, on a, on a weed, uh, whereas um, you know, with, with uh, some of the spray technology that we're using at the moment, some of the selective spraying technology, we're spraying a much wider band, obviously, than that we might be uh, switching on uh, two, you know, three nozzles and or you know, five times, just depending on, on what size weed we're, we're chipping out. So, yeah, one's, one's a, a very much a, a big hammer sort of approach and, and, um, uh, and one's very precise, you know, and they've each probably got their application depending on the crop type and, and uh, and also you know, the type of environment it's going to be operating in. And just one last question from me, the, the weed chipper, correct me if I'm wrong, but that has weeded sensors, doesn't it? That's correct, yeah. So, uh, let's see if we go back. Um, that's right, you can see the uh, the weed sensors, the weed it sensors uh, just up the top there in front of that um, in-frame wheel. So, um, yeah, that, that's what's detecting the weeds and, and then the tines are acting um, uh, as, as a response to what that uh, sensor is picking up in much the same way that it would uh, in, a, in a spraying scenario. So. Great. Um, yeah, look, uh, in terms of selective spraying, and, and, it, and it is interesting, you know, that the development of, um, of uh, you know, green on brown and green on green uh, as we've been going along. And obviously, uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion about the, the bilberry um, product, which is on the Agripack sprayers. Um, they've been working pretty hard, uh, certainly in WA, uh, to gather a lot of imagery required to, uh, to, to, for the AI to learn what some, some of these weeds look like, in particular radish uh, in the West. Um, we, uh, in our biannual pilgrimage to uh, Agritechnica, which is a big machinery show in Germany, we did see some work that uh, Bosch was doing with Bayer um, uh, in, in what was called their um, Zavio Smart Sprayer. So we had a bit of a fiddle with this while we were there and, and um, we really got in and tested it out uh, in terms of throwing some weeds under it. We were, this is very uh, subtle compared to what we were doing later on in the piece. But yeah, as you can see there, um, uh, there's a, a, a crop on the, on the left uh, or a crop plant on the left. Uh, when, uh, and I'll just play that again, uh, when uh, weeds are uh, placed under the under the camera and sensed, um, we've got a number of spray lines that you can see up the top and depending on the weed, uh, a different spray line would would, uh, would switch on and I thought that was that was pretty neat technology so um, yeah just watching that again you can see um, that's the, the crop plant there when the weeds brought underneath um, so you can see that blue line, a spray line up the top uh, turns on and, and sprays that weed with that particular spray, you can see there's, I think, um, four other spray lines there as well. So, so look, that's uh, that's some of the tech that's happening out there. And again, um, you know, potentially that that might lend itself to an autonomous platform. So Ben, that one there is detecting what species of weed it is and spraying a different herbicide depending on the species. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's that's correct, Newms. Yeah, so you've got um, yeah those four spray lines um, dosed with uh, four different uh, chemistry options and uh, and different weeds um, that are detected under the camera. There uh, will be sprayed with a different uh, with a different chemistry according to uh, to whatever the prescription might be for that particular weed. So uh, that's probably taking it the next step. Um, I think it would be good to just see us get at least a green on green for a start. And I think it's probably important for us to uh, to walk before we can uh, run in terms of uh, expectations uh, from some of this green on green. It does take a lot of work to get it up and running. Absolutely. So get your questions coming in, everybody. If you've got a question for Ben, just type it in the box, and we'll we'll pause and answer it. But yeah, sounding good, Ben. Keep on keep on going. No worries. So look, the other one that uh, is obviously uh, interesting is is microwave weed control. Um, um, and, and again, this is the sort of thing that would lend us lend itself to uh, to all, uh, autonomous applications. Um, uh, one of the issues with with microwaves is you're looking at about um, two kilowatts uh, per um, per width of, of application. So you can see the the horns there; uh, they're about 11 centimetres wide. So um, you know, it, and it's a, a relatively slow process. And, and in my discussions with some of the guys from uh, from Swarm Farm, and we'll we'll get to their autonomous platform a little bit later on in the conversation. They were saying that you know microwaves is definitely an area they're looking at, and they've done some trial work and have been able to kill some strips of lawn uh, out in front of their office, which I thought was pretty interesting. So, um, you know, de def definitely some application here with the uh, with the microwaves. Um, so, did you and, say it's you know, two kilowatts per horn? That's yeah. That's that's uh, the research that, I, that I've done. Yeah, you're looking at two kilowatts per horn. Uh, so you can see there, that's eight kilowatts just across the width of that trailer. And I suppose um, thinking about the power requirement for anything wider, it could be would be very high. Um, so again, small um, potentially autonomous machinery um, operating these these microwaves might be uh, might be something that uh, you know could take off. So I think it's probably worth a space worth watching. Um, I should add that as we go along, um, in terms of the weed control options, uh, we're probably getting more and more into the realm of uh, blue sky. So um, the next one I've got here is uh, electricity for weed control. And again, um, some of the autonomous platform operators I've been speaking to uh, over the last few weeks, uh, a number of them have indicated that they're uh, excited about looking at um, using uh, electricity. Um, one of them referred to it as electricide, which I thought was a great term. Um, but I'll just run a couple of little videos. The one on the left is obviously um, you know, the, the early stages and, and the single sort of spot application of electricity for weed control. So uh, a ground spike or an earthing spike, and then using uh, a pinpoint to uh, to zap the weeds. Um, they say that uh, they're boiling them from the inside out. So they are getting some control um, and uh, and I think uh, it would drive anyone mad behind a, a, the steering wheel uh, if they were, they were in, a, in a tractor cab doing that um, for any period of time. So uh, looking at it on a larger scale, um, this is obviously in a horticultural application, uh, taking out uh, grass weeds beside uh, the rows. You can see that it's been scaled up uh, significantly and, and potentially that's what we might look at uh, if we were to, to mount some of this uh, these electrical weed control options uh, on an autonomous platform. Now, I think we've all probably seen uh, what an electric fence uh, does to uh, an area um, where it's been shorted out and certainly kills the grass pretty quickly. So very similar principle um, in this regard. Right, as I said, we're getting more and more into the realm of uh, blue sky, and this is one that uh, we saw again in, at Agritechnica a couple of years ago. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of uh, press about this, so I'm not sure how much further it's progressed since we last saw it. Um, but hey, who doesn't like a good laser zapping, uh, particularly when it comes uh, to weeds? So I'll kick this off. Uh, the puff of smoke, I think, is probably my favourite bit. They must be terribly satisfying to uh, to be zapping weeds. Um, again, uh, very slow, as you can see, and obviously only suited to, to very small um, weed plants. This was uh, designed, I think, for, uh, it was definitely horticulture. It might have been a strawberry uh, farm application. Uh, and yeah, using uh, it's a, a four watt laser 
um, obviously directed straight to the plant to again do a similar job to what the, uh, the electrical um, uh, probe was doing before there and, and, and basically boiling uh, the, the, the moisture inside uh, the weed. So uh, again, very slow, um, suited, suited again to the autonomous platforms, um, you know, and something to potentially keep an eye on. Um, I'm not sure how, how practical it is, but uh, it certainly gets the Star Wars fans excited. It looks fantastic. It's all these things you've just mentioned are pretty instantaneous, aren't they? The uh, microwave, the electrocution and the laser. So um, I guess the good thing about those blue sky things is you get instant weed control instead of waiting for a herbicide to work sort of thing. Yeah, that's right. And you can probably also see you know, how effective it's been um, as soon as you finished. So, um, or very, very soon after. Yeah. Now I've got someone uh, putting a comment there saying they can't hear anything. If anyone else is having that problem, please put a uh, something in the question box. Um, but I, as far as I can tell, that might be just a problem at your end. Um, you might just have to find your computer speakers or something. Um, and we do have everyone muted. We don't get people to ask questions orally. We uh, just uh, have questions typed in. Okay, Go, going well, okay. Ben. Yeah. No worries. Well, let's uh, perhaps move on uh, then to the options for automation, and they are multiple. Um, and there's, uh, I think nearly every week, uh, I see something come across my desk in terms of a new autonomous platform. So uh, one of the latest uh, is in the centre there. It's an autonomous tractor from China, um, looking very, uh, I don't know, very sporty uh, and, and, and sleek. So, um, but look, we have got larger companies like uh, CNH working on these platforms, and, and in fact, um, the two platforms you can see there, uh, the standard New Holland tractor, um, that's um, been around for a little while, as has the um, Case IH uh, autonomous concept vehicle, which I believe is uh, residing now in a, in a museum somewhere in North America. Um, uh, which way we're going to go first, I'm not really sure. I, I suspect that, uh, and you can see on the right hand side, is the uh, is the FENT um, operating uh, in northern New South Wales um, at Beefwood Farms. Uh, in this instance, um, pulling selective sprayer and also doing some um, wheel, rent, uh, wheel track renovation work. So uh, I think that's probably you know, an easy platform for us to go to is obviously using the existing um, machinery that we've got. Uh, and adapting that to autonomy. Um, and look, look, obviously the technology's there already in a lot of cases. Um, we just become steering wheel jockeys and, and in a lot of cases we don't even touch the steering wheel. So uh, the, the tech is there. I suppose there's all, obviously a lot of concern about safety uh, and, and autonomy. You know, if you're not, not around and you've got a two or 300 horsepower tractor running around, people want to know that you, you, there's safe and there's fail safes and there's some redundancy in those safety um, considerations on each machine. So uh, what I think will probably happen first is um, the, from a machine automation perspective is the master slave and we've already seen it. Um, uh, you know, and I'll give you an example is, is where we've got John Deere um, with the machine link where that we can the, basically the harvester controls the, the chaser bin uh, tractor. Um, so there's some instances where one machine controls the other already. Um, this is some, some footage I found of a uh, master slave arrangement uh, doing some pretty heavy tillage in, I'm assuming it's Europe. Um, but you can, there's no driver in that second tractor. So there's some smarts that go into obviously driving this. Um, and it's not just about following uh, at a set distance. Uh, in most cases, the paddock needs to be mapped out and the most efficient way to drive it will be, uh, will be laid out there's a driver in one machine and no driver in the other, so you halve your labour cost unit straight away. So Ben, all of those things you've just shown us, um, are they all aftermarket uh, driverless technology that's been added to those tractors or are they developed by the companies? Uh, so C&H uh, have, have worked um, by themselves on, on their platform and the ACV, that Autonomous Concept Vehicle from Case and, and the uh, New Holland Drive. Um, that's obviously happened at the at the machinery manufacturer level. Um, uh, the the FENT unit that uh, the Beefwood were using uh, that's aftermarket. Uh, my understanding is that the 
the, the setup on these two fence is uh, is actually proprietary. So Fent worked on that as well. So uh, I think it's called Guide Connect or something like that. So um, you know, the machinery manufacturers are aware of what's going on, and they're they're certainly working behind the scenes to make some of this work. I, mean, I guess in in the in the context of a large machinery manufacturer, they want to make sure that they've uh, got this pretty well nailed before they release it to the market. So, um, I, you know, we haven't seen it yet, but I don't think it's too far away. And rumours I've heard is that the, the bigger companies, the tractor companies are too scared to bring it out for fear of litigation. And for that reason, um, people have told me that it's more likely to come first as an aftermarket and then you know, the first tractor that goes across a bitumen road or something, the, the court case that ensues from that will be the first test case. Uh, what is your thoughts? Do you think we'll um, do you think we'll see aftermarket first or do you think we'll see these companies bring this to market soon? Uh, it's interesting, Newms. I think, um, and we'll, let's use Blue River as an example, where the tech has been certainly developed by a third party uh, and then picked up by one of these larger organisations like Deer, you know, and then they've paid significant money for the IT and technology that's gone behind uh, behind that that development. Um, that's probably where I, I see it had happening. Um, so you've got um, some some um, really smart technology out there, and and you know, there's a hundred AI systems um, to pick from in terms of weed recognition, for example. Um, it just depends which one works the best and, and, you know, they all need capital. And so the larger machinery manufacturers have got the capital, makes sense for them to, to either acquire the company um, or, or pick it up. I think probably there'll be a combination of the two. I, I think, uh, you know, from a larger manufacturer perspective, um, they'll be looking to to some of these smaller startups that have got some really bright, um, young um, software engineers working uh, on some of the tech that sits behind it and looking to work with them and, and throw some capital their way. I think probably you're right in you know, um, the, the, the chances of something going wrong are certainly there, but I have to say every uh, autonomous platform that I've seen, the levels of redundancy built into to that from a safety perspective, whether it's geo fences or whether it's, um, uh, you know, um, LiDAR or, or radar or a combination of all three um, are, are significant and, and you know the, the the manufacturers have been always erring on the side of caution and I think that probably makes sense. No one wants to see a two or three hundred horsepower tractor run across a road uh, and potentially stifle um, the development of this further on. So yeah I think safety is safety is first and foremost in the minds of everyone working on this stuff. I think 300 horsepower tractors go across the roads with humans behind the wheel already, don't they? So um, <laughs> I guess yeah. it just has to be a whole lot better than a human, which um, I'm guessing they're already at. Um, another question with the master and slave, you showed this one here with the follow the leader one, the, the, uh, the driverless tractor being behind the driven tractor. I was on the road with Ray Harrington and Andrew Messina and they were talking about this for harvest. and. And Andrew sort of said, yeah, I don't really want the harvesters following me because if one of them caught fire, I wouldn't be able to see it. Um, and Ray just said, well, we just put the, the driverless harvesters in front. Um, is that possible, Ben, or does it have to, does it have to follow? Uh, look, I'm, I'm not sure, Newm, so I would assume that you could probably have either. Um, uh, I suppose they'd normally put the master in, in front just so if there was an issue, uh, that master tractor got there first and, and could put a halt to things mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Uh, I hadn't thought about it uh, in, a, in a harvesting um, context, but, but certainly I, I don't imagine, you know, it's just about one machine coordinating with another and at least having one operator on site. I think that's, a, that's what this is all about, um, not moving to full autonomy. Um, it's, it's about having, uh, I suppose, a, a an intermediate stage um, before we go to that full step. I know. Um, so moving on, uh, let's have a chat about Swarm Palm. We've talked about them a little bit uh, already. Uh, um, Swarm Palm, we've got about uh, five machines already out there and working. I think they've got about 24 in the pipeline split between um, broadacre grains or cotton and, and then horticulture. So uh, they've got a, there's a fair bit happening on that front. Um, uh, they are apparently working and, and hope to release this year an autonomous docking and, and refilling uh, system. So uh, I assume that will be for product. Uh, I imagine refueling would need to happen uh, separately. 
uh, with some uh, human intervention. Uh, in terms of cost humes, I think that's something we had talked about previously and um, you know, a three year operating lease is, is how these things are distributed, um, costing just under six grand a month, uh, so about 69,000 a year. Uh, and that and that's a full um, full lease, which means that the operator is uh, responsible for oil changes, filters and tyres only. So uh, I have seen these things operating the paddock, um, um, uh, operating independently with a, 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 actually a lawn slasher on the back on a on a turf farm. Um, did a little bit of work with one, and uh, yeah, I must admit the uh, the interface is pretty easy to use. And I'd be interested if there's anyone. Uh, any of the, anyone in the audience who's uh, either got one in on order or is is uh, is looking to to order one or thinking about it. So um, yeah, but as I mentioned, uh, as we're talking about some of those weed control options, I know these guys are, are looking at some of those. So uh, here's a, a, a video of uh, one uni working in the in the paddock um, with the, in a selective spraying uh, scenario, and I think there's some footage here of one uh, with a with a blanket spray as well. So two ton footprint. Um, a hydraulic drive, um, small diesel, uh, so they're trying to keep that weight down. Um, one ton payload, I think, uh, is is correct. So um, try to stick within those bounds. So uh, that's that's where Swarm Farms at. Yeah, they're pretty nifty, aren't they? I mean, you've got a machine out there, spot spraying on its own, it could do a very long day, really, couldn't it? It could go really all day and night for that operation. Mm. So. I guess um, yeah, we would have to just do the numbers on how many hectares it can do a day and how many days a year you put it to work and see if it uh, if we can get it to compare to uh, a boom spray driven by a person. Um, yeah, certainly very interesting concept. But um, one question for me is, does it have um, you know redundancy? Will it shut off if someone walks in front of it, or are these yeah. ones not that they do? Yeah. Yeah, they do. And, and rather than use LiDAR, which uh, a lot of the other tractors you would have noticed is a little puck looking thing on the front of the, uh, say the case, um, autonomous concept vehicle. And uh, a lot of the others use LiDAR, um, um, which is light detection ranging to, to sort of paint a picture, if you like, that becomes the eyes of the machine. Uh, these guys actually use a visual camera. Um, so it's a standard RGB feed uh, and they detect objects with two of those. So you get some parallax there uh, and you're able to detect objects and, and stop. Uh, and I can uh, attest to the fact that it will stop because of when we were doing some work on it, I walked in front of it just to see if that would happen and uh, yeah, it did pull up, which is good because it had a, a small slasher on the back of it and so uh, I lived to tell the tale. Yeah, sacrificing yourself all in the name of science. That's very selfless of <laughs> <what> you, Ben. <laughs> and uh, do they slow down if there's a gully um, coming up or something or, or do they just sort of bounce through it? Yeah, look, I think that's one of the issues with any of this um, autonomous equipment is that, um, you know, we all know that, that over time, you know, things go or change within the paddock. So if you've got a big boggy patch or something like that, um, the machine's probably not going to pick that up. Now, that probably could be programmed into it, I guess, in the future. But uh, if you've got an operator on board, um, they're lo more likely to see that and, and actually pull the machine up as opposed to uh, you know, the machine, uh, the, the autonomous machine might just continue on and, and get itself bogged. So I think there's, you're right, there's some challenges there perhaps that, that need to be thought about, but um, I guess it's horses for courses, Newms. Mm. Um, we'll move on uh, a similar platform to the Swarm Farm. And, and that's the um, Dot Technology Corp out of uh, North America. Um, these guys, uh, again, using uh, hydraulic drive, uh, they call this a toolbar that they can fit a whole lot of stuff to. Um, so, yeah, basically the, the toolbar uh, goes along and, and there's a series of, of tools that uh, are designed to fit to it, and in this case a cedar. So I, I talked a little bit before about, um, you know, requirement for capital to drive some of this, and, and uh, you'll notice that this is in Seedmaster colours um, because it's a pretty heavy involvement between the two companies. I think um, the, the ownership structure is uh, one and the same. So um, yeah, as you can see, uh, doing a lot of, uh, or doing a, a season of seeding there, and I think they're on their second now. I've seen a, a, a sprayer mounted to the same platform, um, and I think they're working on a grain cart as well. So we're gonna catch up with these guys when we're in Germany again this year, and hopefully find out what, uh, what the next step is for the DOT Technology Corp. When I look at DOT and, I, and um, Swarm Farm, what I see is they've essentially reinvented the tractor, haven't they? 
And the question mm. that always springs to mind is, do we need to reinvent the tractor or do should we really just focus on making our current tractors um, driverless and, and attach whatever we want behind them? I guess it's a philosophical question, but uh, where do you think we'll head, Ben? I, I suppose the answer is we'll have a bit of both, but um, yeah. have you got a feeling either way? Oh, look, I think um, if, you, if you're going to have a robotic tractor, there's a lot of redundancy um, built into a regular tractor that, that um, probably we pay a lot of money for and don't use if it's going to be run um, purely and simply uh, autonomously. Um, I guess the issue is if something goes wrong with the autonomy and you need to get in it and drive it, it's nice to have that, that as a backup um, mm. and, and throw a human on there. So there's an argument for both, I'd say, humans, and, and probably depending on uh, just how critical the task is, um, you know, it, it might um, sway which way that goes. Certainly in the first instance, it's very easy to to um, to convert what we've already got. And as I said, the technology is already there and we're controlling um, uh, chaser bin tractor, tractors with harvesters already uh, in terms of, you know, effectively that becomes autonomous in, in one sense, even though there's a driver sitting in the seat. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, I think, uh, as I say, there's a cabin and a seat and a air conditioning and all of, all of the mod cons that, that go with that that add cost to a to a machine to a machine that um, you know in a straight and autonomous uh, piece of equipment you don't necessarily need. So yeah, arguments for both. It's almost as if we need um, the tractor companies to bring out a tractor with just the most basic essentials in a cab, um, uh, and then the driverless capacity, but. Anyway, I'm sure the companies will um, they'll, they will know best. They will know what the consumer wants. I think that's called a Bolaris, isn't it, Newms? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> that's right. I mean, can you still buy those, can you? I don't know. Yeah, we have seen some um, when we've been in Europe. So um, I'll move on. Uh, going from, and we're going down in scale, obviously, this is um, the, the FENT Mars system. And, and again, a little bit like the uh, uh, the weed control technologies is probably getting further and further from reality. But this is their single row cedar, the Zaver. Um, and as you can see there, these things are supposed to rock up on a trailer uh, and, uh, and you know, go out in a fleet and do the job and come back to the trailer to, to refuel or refill. Um, so um, obviously all uh, electrically powered, and we'll talk about electrics in a minute uh, and just why that's uh, a very common uh, platform that people use. But you can see something like this perhaps, Newms, um, going along uh, and potentially mechanically weeding um, smaller areas. So, uh, and if there's a fleet of them, that's all good. I guess, you know, where there's some issues for me is that you know uh, these smaller units, apart from looking like an esky, and someone might maybe potentially wanting to steal them or open them up looking for the cold beer. Uh, you know, there's more thing, there's more moving parts, there's more things to go wrong. But equally, there's there's potentially more of them if something does go down. So um, yeah, it's just, just an interesting concept, and I don't think it's anywhere near commercial reality. As you can see, there's a, a few concepts around. Um, yeah, just, just probably something to think of uh, in terms of a platform for some of those weed control technologies we talked about earlier. That is very cute. I think most people would just picture it. You're pressing a button and it driving over and bringing your beer, that one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, um, I talked about electrics and, and the reason for that is that um, we've got a company in uh, North America, again, the Autonomous Tractor Corporation, and you would, um, uh, as the name would suggest, they spend a lot of time working on autonomous machinery. They've got a, a fair bit of money behind them, um, but they spend a lot of their time converting uh, hydraulically driven machinery into uh, electric drive machinery. And, and the reason for that is that uh, if we're talking about autonomy, it's a lot easier to control uh, an electric drive than it is to control a hydraulic drive or a standard uh, drive through a transmission. So. Um, what, what we've got here is in a, the example of a self-propelled sprayer where they pull the hydraulic pump and, and wheel motors off and replace those with a 250 kilowatt generator for electric wheel motors and what they call electric transmission, which is just the, the brains that sit behind that um, where the, the hydraulics have been replaced um, by electric. So they spend a fair bit of their time um, retrofitting, if you like, uh, older equipment um, and getting it prepped um, in, in an electric sense and 
then it's ready for uh, for autonomy uh, or autonomous application. So I thought I'd just throw that slide up because it does bring us to the final slide, which is just again about electrics um, and what's happening in that space. We've got uh, Fent with a little E100, which is just a small 50 kilowatt tractor. Um, uh, charges up to I think about 80% in uh, 40 odd minutes using a high capacity charger. But as you can see, pretty much everything else, if you didn't know it was electric, apart from the absence of an exhaust pipe, you'd probably think that it, um, that it was just your, a regular machine. So uh, electrics is coming a long way and, and that will that will aid, I suppose, the, uh, the, the development of autonomous uh, equipment in the long run. Um, just because uh, electrics is, is a much easier platform to control. You've got 100% torque and zero RPM with your wheels, uh, with your wheel motors, and and, um, and it is you know, quite simple. There's less less perhaps to go wrong uh, in, in terms of uh, you know blowing hydraulic pumps and, and whatnot. So uh, and hoses. So uh, yeah, I just thought I'd finish off with that one, Newms, and we can perhaps move to some questions if you'd like. Yeah, I have heard you say that before, Ben, that electrics are easier to control and we're seeing it with electric cars and so on. But I must admit, when I think of what we've got in the paddock now, we've got tractors that are auto steering up and down big long runs and uh, and it doesn't seem that complex to me to slow down a diesel tractor and turn it around and get it going again. But obviously there's a bit more to it than I am anticipating. Um, do we really need to go electric to go autonomous or is it just sort of make it better? Uh, it'll probably make the, the transition easier. You're absolutely right. There's no reason why we can't control and we, we are controlling what we're doing already. Um, it's just the, the fact that we've got um, gears to deal with and, or transmission to deal with uh, as well. It's just another another layer, I guess, of control that we need to apply, whereas electrics is just a, typically a, a zero to 10 volt signal that will adjust the speed that the machine operates at and or switches things on and off. So it just makes the, the, the shift to autonomous machinery easier and that's why you see some of those smaller systems like little fence saver etc and, and the Chinese track that, that we showed at the very start um, you know they've, they've opted for, for electrics and I think um, uh, you know as you say it's, it's not essential um, and there's some pretty significant challenges if, if we're to implement these things on farm at a larger scale uh, and that is that we just don't have adequate power supplies on farm uh, in many cases to recharge tractors and, and we'd probably need to sit down and do the economics because I suspect that uh, it probably isn't uh, terribly cheap to, uh, in a total cost of ownership perspective to, uh, to to run electrics over you know what we're currently doing with diesel. So um, food for thought there though, Nunes. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm just trying to open a question here. Do not forget that with electric operations you use there's no gearbox or gears and torque is enormous. I think you did mention the torque but also, yeah, the, the lack of gearbox, um, you just sort of wonder if we did go electric whether we would have a tractor which would be extremely robust and run for a very, very long time. Yeah, potentially. And we've seen um, companies like Caterpillar um, actually build uh, earth moving equipment with electric drives as well. And one of the things that we do see at Agritechnica is that uh, I guess we get an insight as to what might be coming. And, you know, large um, manufacturers like ZF, who are, who are transmission makers, um, we go onto their stand two years ago and, and there they are there with an electric transmission, you know. So, so basically trying to take, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the best of both worlds, if you like, and, and uh, you know, basically convert uh, diesel drive to uh, diesel electric um, drive ultimately. And, and that's, that's one of the options we've also got new just to go diesel electric, you know. So um, mm. you, you stick with the diesel engine, but you've also got the the benefit of uh, electrics. And there's a reason that um, you know um, that you know, they've been using on locomotives for a long time. Yeah, I did have one person comment when they looked at Dot. Uh, he said to me that it, he just didn't think it would work because it was diesel over hydrostatic, and thought he thought that it would be much better as diesel over electric. Have you got an opinion there about, you know, for that particular machine? Do you think diesel over electric would be a better option? Uh, look, um, I don't know, Noom, so it probably, um, they've obviously got the system working, so it, it's there and in, 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 in operation. And I know Swarm Farm have been fine, you know, at that smaller scale. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the transition to electric m might happen in that, um, you know, that we've also seen some, um, implements now uh, electrically powered Fent, I think, for example, um, 
run uh, a system where they've got a, a, um, a generator in, sandwiched in between the transmission and the, and the engine, and that's actually used to drive implements. So the you know, implements drive with a 750 volt drive at the back end. So they've got this enormous power point, if you like, off the back of the tractor yeah. that, that drives a, a hay rake, for example. So um, yeah, look, these things all happen in stages, I think, and, and probably you know, in the likes of, uh, for the, the likes of DOT, um, they're probably gone with what's easy to fix on farm and, and um, you know, what, what farmers are familiar with and, and there's a there's an element of that as well that we've got to consider. Yeah and we've just had another comment come in here, you know someone has said that recharge could be from cell phone solar panels uh, in Australia, what are your thoughts about that? I mean it's probably another thing we'd have to do the sums on um, to see whether it's yep. worth owning a bank of solar panels to power your tractor but I yeah. can also see a situation where it could be raining and you want to go seeding, but there's no sun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I think, yeah, the numbers is where, where it comes down to and, and some back of the envelopes, so I haven't done it myself, I saw someone else do, suggested that um, it's a pretty expensive way to go um, to, to solar power uh, or solar charge thing. So um, the only way you could probably do it is with a very large solar um, uh, panel uh, arrangement array uh, and then swappable battery packs is probably the only way to do it. Now John Deere have got a, a, a tractor that they run on electrics and the, the battery in that looks like I think it weighs about one and a half tons it's huge so the, yeah there's some logistics in terms of, of, of that transition but look you know it, 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 it's, it's all possible um, it just comes down to the numbers and whether they stack up and, and that technology will always improve so battery tech is always uh, improving and, and driven by um, consumers and vehicles and I, th I think sometimes in ag we're, we're fortunate that we've got other people um, doing a lot of R&D for us that we can eventually use and apply. Yeah okay everyone we're nearly out of time and if you do have any last questions please put them in now. I guess my last question to you Ben is um, what's coming next? I mean we've got we've seen AgriFact with their um, uh, sea and spray uh, and so it looks like sea and spray green on green is coming pretty soon and something that we could see a fair bit of uh, very soon but also so that's the weed control part of it but what's coming next in terms of driverless? Uh, are we likely to see one of these companies come out with a significant driverless? I know we've, we're sort of hypothesising here but are we likely to see a company come out with it or are we likely to see a, an aftermarket really take us by storm? Uh, we'll probably see the aftermarkets first and foremost, but but we're they're a little bit hamstrung, Newms, I suppose, in in, um, in the way that that a lot of the machinery now, um, you know, there's there's uh, proprietary software that sits inside them that that uh, maybe makes it more difficult, I suppose, for some of those um, third parties to tap into the machine and and uh, and control it and or make changes, particularly if the machine's then updated, um, and I think that's. We've already seen that in some instances. Um, yeah, so look, I think that the larger manufacturer will probably sit on the fence for a little bit longer and they'll definitely want to do their R&D themselves and, and, um, and get plenty of hours under the belt before they introduce something um, commercially and, and widespread. Um, but, you know, never say never. As I say, you know, it's pretty amazing to see what happens, um, you know, just on the componentry front the demand is obviously there and it's being driven by those larger manufacturers. So I can probably tell you a little bit more um, about the middle of November news um, after we go to Agri-Technica again this year. Oh, they're letting you go again, are they? I uh, thought they might have put a travel ban on you after your last efforts. Um, what <laughs> about... Out of our pocket, uh, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, does it really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> what about uh, sea and spray? Um, oh, we've sort of started to see AgriFact. Yeah. Um, any thought, any predictions on, on how much we'll see and when? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of that is going to be governed by um, all of the variables uh, in, in terms of teaching the AI what to do um, and, and, and what weed we're chasing. You know, if there's if some in particular, uh, I guess we've, we've just probably got to make sure that we don't um, overpromise and, and under deliver on the on the the sea and spray or the, the green on green stuff uh, in that um, there's a lot of work going on there's a lot of lot more work to, to be done because uh, because every weed will be you know it looks different uh, at different growth stages it looks different in different environments it looks different when it's um, water stressed or heat stressed or um, been frosted so um, yeah I think there's there's a lot of imagery that sits in behind that AI, those AI systems and there's a, a stack of 
AI systems, as I mentioned before, to pick from. So, um, you know, you can, uh, I've been told that you can even get a hold of the Facebook al algorithm, which will, uh, can be tuned to, to look for weeds. So, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of options out there, I suppose, um, you know, just in terms of who's got uh, the time, money and smarts to be able to develop those um, fastest will be first to market. But you know, we've already seen a couple of players and, and we know of a couple of others that uh, are working pretty hard to, to bring us some of that tech. And it's happening you know, on a research front as well, which I think is exciting. Yeah. Well, good on you, Ben. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, always good to hear from you and yeah, good to, to see a lot of this tech. And yeah, looking forward to seeing what you've got after Agritechnica, Agritechnica you know, yeah, if I've got that <laughs> right. So thanks for your time, yeah. mate. Well, thanks very much, Newman. It's great to chat.